uh, Thea Tressler, who's the drop-in coordinator, and I'm sure uh, someone who a lot of you know, um, and uh, can be seen around town with her, um, her large dog, Bo. Um, and Penny Ravinsky, who was doing the Women's Equality Project through the Status of Women. Um, as Kaylin has mentioned, we, at that time, we were very well funded. We had operational funding. We had, uh, uh, I think the three of us were working part-time and then probably volunteering part-time as well. Uh, we had a lot of, pro uh, of uh, programs running. Um, and a lot of groups that were meeting on a regular basis in the, in the Tropin Center, um, for example, the Coos Women. And we, uh, we were finding that um, we had, a, I think the Tropin Center was open about four days a week at the time, and it was thriving. Uh, the Tropin Center was, was full almost every day of the week. We were finding that we were doing a lot of referrals uh, to other organizations. Um, we were finding a lot of women were coming in uh, dealing with issues of poverty, housing, employment, uh, and violence. And I'm sure over the years we were, we were saying that that's a, a regular theme. Um, but what happened uh, during the time that I was there was that uh, the Liberals came to power. And as soon as the Liberals came to power, they immediately cut funding to women's centres. Now, there were 37 women's centres in British Columbia at the time, and the operational funding was, uh, I think, a total of $2.4 million, and, which isn't a whole lot when you consider, but uh, you know what 37 women's centres were doing with those funds was absolutely incredible. And so, so it was a huge, huge loss, loss. And, 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 and we were just, just absolutely, absolutely stunned. Stunned. We really like so, so immediately, we uh, uh, joined together with the BC and Yukon Association of Women's Centers and tried to fight for the restoration of funding. And at, at that time, we had lots of questions about what do we do, you know, do we, uh, and I think, I think it's Naomi Wolf who says, you know, do we fight fire with fire or do we, uh, you know, burn down a master's house? So we discussed different strategies for, for dealing with this, this issue of funding cuts and, uh, you know, do we, we do direct actions, do we, you know, try and speak their language, which is the language of corporate economics. Um, and we tried a number of different tactics. At that time, uh, they had merged, there was no longer a standalone uh, uh, women's equality ministry. We had lost that. It had come under the ministry of, of uh, the community, women's, aboriginal services. Um, Macaws, that's right. And Lynn Stevens was the woman, woman who was attached to, she had the portfolio of, of uh, women's equality. And when we spoke to her, we realized that she had very, very little understanding of, uh, you know, what women face in terms of, of economic hardship. And, and uh, well, I mean, I, I don't even think she really sort of got on a level of feminism 101 course, you know. It was very, very challenging to, uh, to speak with her. And at one point she said, um, well, uh, you know, if, if women need more money, they should just make more money. So in response to that, we got a little creative and we started making more money. So dollars with Lynn Stevens' face on the dollar and started to give them out as one of our protest actions. And I think I noticed back on the table too, there was some, uh, there's some Rosie Riveter um, uh, handbills uh, um, urging um, uh, Prime Minister, or, or Prime Minister, God forbid, Premier Campbell to uh, to restore the cuts to women's centres. Um, anyway, during that time, we uh, you know we we talked a lot about what we did have in terms of assets in our in our community, and we uh, put a lot of focus and energy into. Um, making sure that we did not lose the house. Um, that was a huge asset. It was something that women came together and, uh, and really um, uh, worked hard to make sure that we had as a community. And we put a lot of energy into um, uh, asking the community uh, to dig a little bit uh, into their pockets and, and come up with some money to pay down the mortgage. And I just want to acknowledge 
everyone who did that. A lot, a lot of people came forward and took money out of their own pocket, and sometimes time and time again, to save the Women's Center, to make sure that women always had a space to come to, and I think that that's absolutely phenomenal. And I just want to say really briefly, there are a couple of really amazing highlights um, uh, during uh, my time at the Women's Center, uh, during those years. And uh, Penny Ravinsky and I uh, applied to the Canadian Women's Foundation and got some funding for a, a women's co-op ventures project. Um, because th there had been a number, I think there had been like 600 job losses in a very short period of time. And we were losing hospital services and, and everything else, as, as, as uh, I'm sure you all remember. Um, some of those have never been restored. But uh, uh, anyway, we, we got some funding and we ran this training program um, because we were trying to think creatively about how do we support women to um, operate their own businesses in a way that, you know, that are grassroots, women-centered, and, you know, and we started talking about social enterprise too. What, what are some of the things that, that uh, we could do to um, feed some money back into the Women's Center? And um, I'm sure that Kathleen will talk about uh, some of those projects that are happening now. But I, I can see, you know, everyone has talked about how, uh, you know, we, we've, we've, we've built over the years the foundation, um, you know, and, and the Women's Center has, has survived for 36 years. And it's because of this community and every woman that has put their time and energy into it. And, um, and I think we can be really, really proud of the fact that we have the oldest uh, rural women's center in Canada. That's no small thing. Kathleen Lupton is, in just a moment, is the current uh, coordinator at the women's center. And I would just like to acknowledge, uh, as somebody who has come back to the organization and is a part of the Coordinating Collective today, uh, I am very, very thankful that Kathleen is who she is and is in her role. And, and we couldn't have a better coordinator in the Women's Center right now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a very interesting place to be sitting at the end of this table, at the end of um, 36 years of women who have um, put their time, their energy, their life force together to make sure that there is a place for women to come to. So I feel honored that I'm here. And I also um, say that sometimes it's a little daunting. I was on the CC. Um, the last year that Cheryl was working, I, I came and I was on the CC in 2003 and in 2004, um, during which time Penny Rubinsky and Cheryl were not only doing the, the cooperative ventures, but they were also doing, Penny was working on a project of uh, women in poverty, and she was working on um, um, gender equity. And um, Penny Stevenson, during that time, I believe that she did a women in the health project. Um, when the... CC was meeting right after all the funding was cut by the Liberals. Some of the discussions at the CC, what are we going to do if we don't have enough money to keep the Women's Center open? And people were actually having discussions like, well, can we keep it open with volunteers? Are people willing to spend the night at the Women's Center in case we need to turn it into a place for women to sleep? Because there was not enough beds at any place for women. Um, in Nelson area, so for the homeless women, and so there was like a lot of discussion talking about strategy and dialogue and, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do for the women who have no place to sleep? What are we going to do for the women if the center closes and there's no one there for referral, no one there to um, be able to support women in the same issues that everyone has talked about is still poverty, it's homelessness. Um, it's finding jobs, skill development, all of these issues still exist. Underemployed and unemployed women. Um, I was hired after Penny Stevenson had worked as a um, interim um, coordinator, interim coordinator during the summer of 2006. And there was another woman named Melanie Trundell, I believe. I never met her. And she was there for only a couple of months before she had a personal tragedy that she had to deal with. So I was hired in November of um, 2006, 
and was told at that time that we had enough funding to stay open for three months. So I thought, oh boy, this is great. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you would never want to be at the tail end of a very successful 30 some years, 33 years, and then to say, okay, I was just hired and to allow it to go down on your watch. That just was like, I'm sorry. So I have to admit, my first year and a half was a bit of a, do a, a devotional to the Women's Center. But then when I first hired in, it was for 18 hours a week. Um, and now I'm working 30 hours a week. The funding we receive is, um, that's been, the steady one is from BC Gaming. Um, we've had some very good luck in this last year in that um, just a couple of months ago, or just a month ago, we received funding from the Voice of Women BC, who when they folded, um, they called Betty Daniel and said, what is a good women's group around here that might be able to continue doing some good work? And so um, Betty called me and said, contact them. And so we went through the process of um, applying to them for money. And we ended up getting $20,000. The thought was we'd only get $5,000. But after them finding out what we were doing, they gave us actually $20,000. Um, we have several things that are going on that are definitely and continuously part of the spectrum that started way back in the, women, in, in the beginning. The Women's Center continues to thrive. We, however, are only open two days a week. And the third day during the week, we have women who are working on a sewing project out of reclaimed and recycled material. And this is exciting because where the cooperative venture project started when Cheryl and Penny Rubinsky had that training. Out of that it came, uh, in 2005, they hired me to write a feasibility study. In this feasibility study, I went all over the West Coopies, talking to women as they were focus groups, trying to decide um, what of three possible social purpose enterprises women might be interested in doing. One was for a women's retreat center, one was for a women's credit union, and the third one was to create products out of recycled and reclaimed textiles. And um, the one that got the most energy and juice and interest was creating product out of um, reclaimed and recycled textiles. Um, last year, this is 2008, so in March of um, 2007, we started up a project working on creating bags that because we only had money for a few months to stay open, the beginning stages of creating these bags out of reclaimed and recycled textiles was a fundraiser. These women, perhaps if they needed, took $5, but what they did is that they raised $3,000 out of making and selling these bags. And that is what kept the Women's Center going until such a time that we were able to actually write some proposals and get some more projects going. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful and impressed with the women who worked on the bag projects. If there's any women here who actually were, have been a part of that bag project, who helped keep the Women's Center open, would you stand up or? Okay. <laughs> there was a couple of other women who were just phenomenal. Um, Diane Atkins and Maureen Petit. Um, Sharon, I thought I saw Sharon come in. Um, and I know there was a few other women as well who worked really hard on that. The exciting piece of, of this project is that it has continued and um, it's been a year and a half and we have the bags being sold probably in about six or seven different stores in Nelson. We just received funding from enterprising nonprofits to be able to take it to the next level and write a business plan and a marketing plan. And we have just hired the group of sewers, just hired Lynn Kao, who has experience in cooperatives, to take it to the next level. And this is phenomenally exciting because if it started in 2005 with the concept of a cooperative, and I wrote a feasibility study, and finally now in 2008 we have funding to be able to move forward with that, I think that's a major success story. And um, as we talked to the people from enterprising nonprofits, they first were talking about, well, what kind of a business are you going to have? Are you going to have the women come in and they're going to work from nine to five, and then we'll have to take out? And I, I was looking at her horrified, and I'm saying that won't work for us. It only works for us if we have something that there's phenomenal flexibility for women if they can only sew um, three months out of the year, 
or if they can only come in and bring and work out of the house. It has to be as flexible as possible. We're now actually in the process of setting that up. The Women's Center in the last year and a half that I've been there continues with those um, yearly activities that have been set up for a long time, along with the project as the Women's Center. There is Take Back the Night. I think we have someone named Anna Paladin. I saw her walk in who's going to help organize that this year along with a very strong events committee from the Women's Center. Um, there is the December 6th, which again um, pays attention to and honors and brings forth the issue of violence against women. International Women's Day and Five Feminist Minutes has always been something that's been incredibly strong as a way to bring forth attention to the various issues. Um, and for also five feminist minutes for the women just to have a really good time. Um, dancing, singing, yelling, doing a rant, whatever it is that they'd like to do. Um, I know that one of the uh, proposals that we had uh, written during this last year was also, and Marsha Brandy wrote it, and it was an attempt to get funding so that we could work with women who were thinking about going into the trades to help them decide if they even wanted to go into the trades. And I'll let Marsha address that just a little bit. Um, as I'm sitting in this spot, I want to say that the Women's Center could not continue. West Coopy Women's Association could not continue without the phenomenal work of all of the volunteers, the phenomenal work of the coordinating collective that um, this year we have um, a lot of new people. We have four new members who just come on, some of which uh, are 23 and 24 years old. We have um, a full um, set of committees that people are actively involved in it. And um, so this is like, we're turning this back around and it's really exciting. I am so honored and delighted to be a part of this movement here. I also started in the early 70s doing what some of the um, early women were talking about with the self-help groups and newspapers. I did that, but I was in the United States at that time. I'm wondering if everyone who is a part of the coordinating collective at the moment, or has been in the past, would please stand. Well, first in this moment, first at this moment, if you're in the coordinating collective, please stand. And we have like, uh, that's just a few, but I think that this is quite incredible, and I want to say thank you. Now, give a big hand. Now, anyone who has ever been on the coordinating collective in the past, please stand. been sponsored and supported by several different groups. This year we actually got, in order to host this event, Columbia Basin Trust came through and they gave us a very generous grant. The Nelson and District Credit Union came through and gave us a, a, an incredible grant. WICWA itself put money, time, and energy towards making today happen, as well as the voice of women, um, BC. So we've had a, a tremendous amount of support. And this event, setting things up, we're going to be having um, a, a group discussion in just a little bit. We're going to have a potluck, and then we're going to be honoring um, people this evening, um, Company of Older Women, um, the Raging Grannies, um, Voice of Women BC, Voice of Women Canada, Images Ad Hoc Singers, and women who worked on the Images newspaper. But in order to pull this off, and in order to get this much together, it took a lot of work from an awful lot of people. I'm going to ask those people. Now, Marsha was the key organizer. And um, would everybody who has helped to put this together today please stand? Because it takes a phenomenal amount of work. So everybody who's been organizing and has helped in some way, please stand up. will be available off to the side and um, that Barbara Brown did for us. And I would like, Barbara, would you stand up so that they can actually see the face of the person who did it? And this, they're a friend of ours, Padma Samchuk, did the sign that's behind, behind here. Um, and the people who organized and set up the, the music behind there. Um, it's incredible, and I could go on and on, and I'm not going to do that because we still have a long 
Oh, you have one on there. But again, it's an honor to be at the table with all the women who have put such time and energy into this organization. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'd like to um, ask the wish of the group. Um, we have uh, two videotaped interviews, both of which went over time. Uh, so they're each about 15 minutes long, but um, I'm, I'm sort of feeling like maybe people would like to see them over dinner because we really do want to open it up and hear what other people have to say. Uh, is that, everybody's good with that? Um, I, one thing I do want to say about Karen Newmoon's interview is her discussion about the volunteers that have worked for and with this organization. Uh, is very inspiring, and she thanks the volunteers who have made this organization uh, from the bottom of her heart. Um, and so I, 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 we will run this later on, and um, because I think that what both of them have to say is extremely inspiring. <laughs> I was blown away. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to say right now that. You've heard the issues that we have all dealt with in the past. You've heard how they have grown, how we worked on them, how they've changed, some of them, not all of them. And we would like to hear from you in the audience about what you think the issues are today and whether we've solved any of the ones that we've been working on and what new issues do you think um, the West Cooney Women's Association and the Nelson Women's Center should be focusing on today or what's in your hearts. And, um, and, uh, I know that we have women here who are working in organizations that uh, are particularly um, women's issues, uh, some are men and women's issues, and not necessarily just women's issues. I know there are people here who have childcare as a heartfelt responsibility, and uh, other issues. So, who wants to be first? I, I, think, I think daycare, it, it could be a very um, good avenue asking for better wages for daycare workers, as well as a re-enactment of more daycare centers. There's not enough daycare centers in the area. There's more women working, and there's many brands that are helping out. But it's really nice to have, and there is a very good support system in Nelson uh, for children. There's a family, the family place organization. But I think that that could be an important issue to tackle. Thank you, April. Hi, if I could just speak to that. I've been Addison. I've been fighting for childcare for 30 years now. And um, you, we need childcare so desperately. In 30 years, I've never seen it as bad as it is today. It's gotten worse, not better. Yeah. Um, I daily hear stories from women who come to either the Child Care Resource and Referral Program or to the daycares crying because they're desperate to find someone to care for their children. Uh, we have parents now trying to bribe daycare centers to get a space because they need to go back to their jobs. We have employers now um, really tr calling up daycares, wanting to get their employees back to work, and they can't. So, uh, and this this ties into affordable housing. It ties into poverty. It ties into children's wellness. It, it covers the whole gamut of our our society. And so, I would just really urge you to uh, make sure in all three of the elections that are coming up over the course of the next several months. Make sure child care is, is mentioned and talked about at all times.
I must say I must plead uh, my political ignorance as to the status of the status of women. But I think any election, any party that claims to have any credibility with the, uh, the electorate needs to, I mean, the dismantling of the status of women, how we as women can even sit here and refer to ourselves as a movement. And it is such a slap in the face. It is like being cut off at the knees. And I have, I worked for the government for years and finally bailed into a TP. I just, I have been lied to for so long that I have a moment in years. I just, I will not do a dance of democracy anymore to pretend that we even still have democracy. But until any party reinstall status of women, I ain't talking to anybody and I'm not listening to any more lies. Thank you. Um, my name is Bonnie Baker. Um, the conservative uh, government didn't just kill the status of women. It killed, and it was a, a, the liberal government before, that killed funding to the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. This government killed all kinds of, all the progressive programs that we have worked, and feminists for the last 30 years have worked to, to create were systematically killed by this conservative government. So it's not just the status of women. The status of women was gutted before it was killed. But um, National, National Action Committee on the status, uh, National Action, Action Committee was an incredible national force for feminism in this country. And within that movement and in that body, we had every discussion, argument, and political um, issue hashed out, fought over. And it was an organizational triumph, really. And that being gone has scattered us all back all over the country to, the, to our little communities again. So it's not, you know, that's one part of the puzzle. But they got the whole thing this time. Thank you, Bonnie. Hi, I'm Shannon. I've been a member of the West Community Women's Association for 10 years. And I've done a lot of research on the White Ribbon Campaign that's um, started by Jack Layton in 1989 in relation to the Ma Montreal Massacre. And um, it was women at that time that didn't want to have men involved in their circles and healing process after that. And because of that, the men decided to take it upon themselves to address issues of ending violence against women. And they organized, and these were Canadian men that did that in 1989. And since then, the White Ribbon Campaign is an amazing international group are men that organize the structures of how to end violence against women and they've done it all over the world in amazing creative cultural ways and I think it's okay now to expect men to help us in this movement and it's happening in other countries very very well they've got um, heroes and celebrities and athletes, male um, RCMPs, um, commissioners of police um, departments uh, they cross and intersect all levels of government, race, class, um, to address ending violence against women. So we could expect from our mayor to instead of uh, sanctioning the right to life campaign here and putting up being part of the big placard outside our town, we could have him talking about how to end violence against women November 25th, which is the 16 days to end violence against women up to the um, International Human Rights Day, December 10th, and have him come to a dinner and speak about it, in, you know, about how he wants to end violence against women. We can expect men to work alongside us now. It's time. It has to happen. And if you ever Google the White Ribbon Campaign, you'll be amazed at how interesting the art walks and the endless, you know, sausage sizzles in Australia that they're doing, like really incorporating, um, you know, thousand dollar teas 
where you have a huge uh, rugby hero sit at your table and uh, you know, 10 other people pay their $100 and you raise $1,000 per table. Like think, around the world this was a Canadian male initiative and it's taken off all over. So we have to be inspired and positive and expect men to be working to end violence against women now. Thank you, Shannon. One thing Shannon didn't mention is that she, in fact, has been the co-chair of the um, West Kootenai Women's Association for uh, how many years now? Oh no, that's not really true. <laughs> I've been there for two and you were the co-chair in the whole time. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's been really wonderful. Uh, in fact, Shannon is the person who, when Stephen Lewis was uh, speaking at the Mir Center for Peace last fall and was talking about uh, the women in Africa who really have to be given, a, uh, the men have to really do a better job of acknowledging the incredible work that women do and that that is what will really bring equality, sustainability, and sustenance to the people of Africa. Um, and that it ha that has to happen all over the world. Shannon went up and talked to him. And in fact, what he did is he, um, he agreed, he encouraged, and he said that he would pay $15 of the membership for every man in this area who wanted to become a member, an associate member of the West Kootenai Women's Association and we now have over 50 associate members. And he paid up, bless his heart. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I was, I'm a social work practicum student, and I used to work at the Nelson District Youth Center with a very amazing woman named Anissa Frangi and she wasn't able to make it today to talk about the Peers Are Here program that she facilitates. So I've come in her place um, and also to um, let people know who I am because I'm organizing Take Back the Night this year. Um, so when I was doing my practicum at the Youth Center, I worked alongside Anissa co-facilitating this program, Peers Are Here. And it's a um, youth, well, youth leadership program where peer, um, young people aged 13 to 18 can receive training in all the so through social service organizations in Nelson so that they can deliver appropriate referrals and also be there to support their peers. And it's, a well, it's been happening for about four years, I think. Four to five years, maybe. Um, so, but the group was pr um, really unique in that it was only young women who were in our group and there were about five of them on, five to six of them on good days. <laughs> Usually two to three showed up weekly. Um, so through working with them, I got to see some of the issues and struggles that young women are facing these days. And um, it is clear that some of the, many of the same struggles exist. Um, and one of them, a huge one that we saw was sexual health. Um, in terms of maintaining healthy relationships, establishing boundaries in relationships, and just um, knowing that they can be assertive and make choices for themselves other than the ones that social norms are urging them to choose. And so um, both Anissa and I saw that um, and in, inside of this struggle for, with sexual health was sexual exploitation where young women are exchanging sexual activities for some kind of gain, sometimes popularity, sometimes a place to stay at night, that's <laughs> um, attention, drugs, clothes, to avoid an argument, or, and, and the list goes on. That was a huge one. Um, some women don't, didn't feel that they have the right to say, or they know that they have the right to say no, but um, the ways of expressing this still aren't really talked about these days. Um, and okay, and so another struggle that we saw was low self-esteem that many women, young women are suffering from and not suffering, but just an issue that they face. And um, a lot of that, a lot of the women in the group would, would um, say things that gave us the impression they really 
in order to have establish an idea of who they were, or um, it, it really depended on what their male counterparts thought of them. So that was interesting. And then also another one was poor body image, and that seems to have been around forever. Um, yeah, although one thing we both, Anissa and I, want to say is that in this group we've seen um, amazing resilience that young women are showing as well. And um, because there are so many pressures being put on them, um, they, they're just so capable of creating um, amazing opportunities for themselves. And all of these women in our group excelled in, in all dimensions of ways. They're really amazing leaders in their community. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I want to say how deeply appreciative I am of the wonderful youth members of our coordinating collective and all the young women who are so bright, intelligent, assertive, and clear thinking, and feminist as well. So I, I just, I feel like we can pass it on. We're still here, we're still working, but we can pass it on. And it's, it's uh, the Women's Center will still be here 36 years from now. Well, passing on may not be the appropriate metaphor, however. <laughs> I can't stand those lights. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Seniors and others are concerned about legislation governing doctor-assisted dying. And I'll leave you with that thought. There are attempts to bring in this kind of legislation in this country, which are consistently defeated. I'm not talking about euthanasia. I'm talking about legally doctor-assisted dying. Instead of prolonging a non-life for a decade, which happens, uh, pay attention to this question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think because I generally can project quite well. I know, but we are taking this. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, no problem. Um, I just kind of want to pick up on the story about uh, Stephen Lewis really quickly because. Uh, it's a really neat story and a testament to spontaneous activism and the good results that come from it. So yeah, Shannon got up and, and said to Stephen Lewis about uh, <coughs> men signing up and supporting the Women's Center, and he said, absolutely, that's a fantastic idea. I will sign up to the West Kootenai Women's Association, and my challenge tonight is to other men in this room to sign up as well, and I'll pay for it. And I was, like, and I was sitting there, and I, I saw Shannon, and I was like, yeah, Shannon, way to go. And then I saw Shannon going out the back door, because she had to go. And I said, oh no. So I, I chased her out the, the back door. She's like, I gotta go, I can't follow up on it. Okay, Shannon, I'll do it for you. And the highlight of my night, because of Shannon, was that I got to sit next to Stephen Lewis and sign up 50 men to the West Kootenai Women's Association. to Stephen Lewis come true. <laughs> okay, pass me the mic for a minute. <laughs> I, was, I was just sobbing so hard um, to, have, to have that acknowledgement. I was, and my son was outside, so I had to leave. It wasn't that I couldn't follow it up. It's just that, you know, I was thinking it would happen down the road. But the thing is, the, the le next time I saw Stephen Lewis, he asked me, so are the male associate members attending your meetings? And that's something that the next time I see Stephen Lewis, I'm going to have to answer. I, I really would like my answer to change. So I, you know, the pressure is sort of on to define the male associate membership and to encourage them to figure out how they can support us as women and the movement. And November 25th is going to come up quick. And those 16 days to end violence against women could be packed with events. 
um, celebrating, honoring women, okay? And I just really hope that they get inspired or that potentially we can help assist the White Ribbon Campaign to really move and uh, end violence against women. Um, I just saw Ju the footage of Fierce Light by Velcro Ripper, uh, the world premiere, and um, the, he has footage of Julia Butterfly coming down Luna, the tree that she saved and lived in for two years, and her legs um, and the muscles in them had atrophied, and they're lowering her down to the ground, and she can't walk, and she's just hugging and sobbing that tree and saying that we did it. So as long, and she says, as long as one person has hope, and as long as it's not something over in the future, or that it's gonna happen one day, but it's in your heart right now in this moment, we can all believe and end violence against women and against our mother, the earth. You know, we need to do that now. I also wanted to touch on an issue that's uh, near and dear to me, and I think is also something that, uh, I mean, we're, we're finding that all these issues that we're bringing up are quite interconnected, and so this is one that's definitely connected to all of them, and that's uh, women's representation. Uh, we're talking about men's representation in the women's movement, but there needs to be women's representation in every aspect of society, and one that's dear, near and dear to me, is something that I do, is of course politics. And increasing women's representation at the political realm is going to be able to address a lot of issues around childcare, which interestingly, it was a universal childcare was a recommendation in the 1970s status of women recommendations, and it's one of the 194 recommendations out of 197 that have not been implemented to this day. So think about getting more women into politics so that they can look back to 1970 and those recommendations and start pulling them forward and making them happen. Because until we have a critical mass of women in politics, that sort of thing just isn't going to happen. So that's one of the issues I just wanted to bring up. Um, can, can I ask you to uh, meet me in the... <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Marcia Early. I work at the Advocacy Center. And I, I just wanted to say how deeply grateful I am to the Women's Center for the existence of our agency. We're 20 years old this year. And the work we do is uh, around helping people with poverty and my role as a community-based victim assistance worker and how this um, agency sprang into being. It was a direct... Um, I would say child of the Women's Center, the issues that were being fought so strongly um, in the 70s and 80s resulted in Carol Ross um, being able to uh, create this agency that was dedicated to a, a number of those, those issues that had been so long carried by this group of women. And um, we're still uh, very unapologetically and explicitly feminist. And I know that for me, issues like legal aid, um, it's appalling for women to get access to um, family court. And uh, I agree that child care and housing are gigantic issues for women, especially in the areas that I see them in. And uh, I'm glad that we're able to do this service. Uh, I see that um, we're, we're all going to be keeping fighting this battle. We just we can't stop. We have to keep. Um, if we if we sit down and do nothing, the forces, the, the counteracting forces in society are going to continue. And we need all the useful energy we can. And I have faith that we're going to keep doing it. And I'm proud to be doing it. I'm proud to be associated with all of you. Who else would like to? Talk a little bit about the issues that are near and dear to your heart. Anyone? Okay. Hi. Um, I'm from Valakin, and I don't. I see a lot of people come through our property, and they uh, many of them are homeless, and we put them up for the night, and and then. I don't know, they stay a week, maybe two, however long, and then eventually they find their way, but um, I don't think there's anything locally. 
or you know, since it's so rural, such a rural area, like I don't see how the women in such dire need, you know, sometimes they're not even able to get on the bus to get to Nelson to get the help. So outreach programs that are, you know, in each community, I'd like to see something like that in my community. And if somebody contacted me sometime, I, was it, no? Someone, and they wanted to start an outreach program, and at that time, it was last year, a little earlier than this, and I, I at the time, I couldn't do anything, I didn't have the energy, and so whoever that was, if, they're, if they, whoever is interested in like an outreach program in the Valakin area to get a hold of me, because that's been kind of in the back of my mind and it's been bothering me that, yes, that is necessary, I should have put it aside. And, and I was given an opportunity to help somebody make that a, you know, make it a reality. And at that time I couldn't do it, so I'm kind of kicking myself in the butt for not taking the time right now at that minute to open my door and say, okay, maybe I don't have time now, but maybe down the road I could. So I'd like to step forward right now and just say that, you know, I do feel that's a big need in my community. And if anyone in that area is has the energy to do that, I would give you my full support in that. And also for the women, uh, I know that there's not a lot of free events in the area and this June probably, the Snipes Nation hosts a Froggy Fest, it's a children's festival that's pretty much free to the community and if anyone of the women's uh, centers want to organize help with that or, you know, offer a free day to just have fun and be with their kids, it's a really good opportunity. So I'd like to put that out there for anybody who'd like to volunteer help. I, there's a lot of ideas thrown around, but I like want to do like a petting zoo and I don't know, there's a lot of ideas that have been coming to me. And even the, if it's a one day event, all of our performances are directed at the children and it's a really good day for the family to just come out on the open land. We usually have teepees put up with events in each teepee for the children. And the children just had so much fun. It was like the, I was at the gates, right? And just watching them in, come in all happy and then get carried out, sleeping with the big painted face. And they were all just so cute. And just like one event, like I heard somebody say that between now and the 365 days, there's a lot of events that can take place in between now and then to help women. And of course, if you help their children, you're helping them. And I think uh, children's events like that is something that I'm proud of that we do for our community. Last year, it didn't get pulled together. But this year, I got so much feedback about it that we're going to definitely pull that together for the kids in June. And so <clears throat> I just welcome everybody to that event. And we'll be putting out flyers or something soon. Thank you. I could just say one word, which is environment. Um, all of the changes that are coming about due to environmental changes, whether they be climate change, peak oil, um, anything like that, will affect uh, the poor and disadvantaged more profoundly than everyone else. And we all know who those people are. So I think it's really uh, important that we recognize the environment ongoingly as a women's issue. Um, and that's all I have to say. I, I just want to uh, comment on, today is the uh, day for fundraising for money for to fight against breast cancer. And I saw on the news uh, last night something that just reminded me that uh, when the women's movement uh, was getting strong during the early 70s, we, women, we feminists were known for bra burning. And last night I saw 
the women of Kelowna have collected enough braziers to to have three spans across the big bridge between uh, on the way to uh, West between West Bank and Kelowna, and I just think I just think that's a great night. Just uh, you know, I hope that they that the people raise a lot of money for that particular purpose. But I, I just saw that wonderful. Uh, uh, actually, the continuity of that somehow. Here, here, um, uh, Kath Kathleen. Uh, and then uh, we have a new woman on our board, Pam Ponick, who is doing a project that is um, focusing on women who are leaving violent relationships, trying to find housing. <coughs> Finding housing for women in general, or have housing for anyone in this area, has just been a tremendously difficult issue because everything is so expensive. Um, so I think this is, is something that um, we just need to pay some attention to. And I also want to say I'm remiss, is that I forgot to mention the woman who ran the drop-in center just before me, Tanya Wright. And I think she was there for almost three years. She followed Thea Thrustler, and she did an incredible job during, I guess it was 2005 and 2006, there was a phenomenal amount of um, violence that was going on, and that the women who came into the drop-in center we're having a um, very, very difficult time. And without, at that time, because we, I believe we had received some $10,000 from someone who was anonymous, but I believe related to Marg Smith, we were actually open, able to keep the drop-in center open for a third day. And during those years, it was due to that connection to Marg Smith that we actually were able to have it open for the third day. So I just wanted to pass those things on. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just have one minute. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Alice Timisberry. I'm the women's outreach worker. All the time for the women. What I'm finding mostly is the housing issue is a really big issue. There is no affordable housing, and the housing that is affordable is, is terrible. And legal aid, as Marcia mentioned, is a, is a real problem. And, you know, the sad part is, as I was listening to the history of the Nelson District Women's Center, it came to me that there's, I think it's a phrase in French, tout ça change, tout c'est la même chose. And that's more that's changed, more it's the same thing. And we're still fighting the same thing that we've been fighting 36 years ago. And I think it's, I just found it so powerful to be here today to listen to all these women's voices. And I feel humble in your presence. And I want to thank you for putting this on. Thank you. Um, I just want to say one thing about an event we haven't talked very much about. In 1974, I was sitting around a lot of kitchen tables in the Slocan Valley where a lot of men and a lot of women were playing music together and it was always wonderful. But whenever I went to an event that was, had a stage and was in public, I only ever saw the men get up and play. So in 1974, I organized the, West, the um, Pass Creek Women's Festival with some support from the Kootenai Women's Council. And it was a two-day festival. Men were allowed to be there, I think, on one day. Uh, some came drunk, it was too bad. And the discussions about whether men should be at the women's festivals has continued ever since. But the thing is that so have the women's festivals. Women getting up on the stage, singing their hearts out, writing songs, doing crafts, selling them, giving each other workshops, having a wonderful, wonderful time together. Uh, it happened in, in 75, we put together a collective. Uh, the Western Canadian Women's Festival happened in Caslow. Rita McNeil flew out from Cape Breton and was singing feminist songs that you would never believe when you listen to her today. <laughs> but taken up after that, particularly by Mo Lyons and others at the Women's Center, if you look around the walls, um, in so many of the years past, at the Valken Hall Community Center and in Harrop and, uh, is it Proctor? 
Proctor, sorry, um, and other places, women have gathered together to celebrate themselves, each other, to learn many things and have a good time together. Because you see, it's not all the hard stuff that we deal with every day, but it's also the fun we can have together. And we're gonna have some of that fun tonight with Carol Street and Bo Conlon and Cheryl Jansen. Cheryl Jansen and Pauline Lamb. And so we really welcome you to stay for the evening. But right now, we're gonna break for dinner. And um, there's uh, all kinds of food that the Kootenai Co-op has donated, that Save On Food has donated, and um, also that the Kootenai Baker, when you take a look at that cake over there, that carrot cake, that real carrot cake. Um, so I'd like to really thank the panel. And one thing I really, really, really want to thank is I want to thank all of the women who were here setting up this beautiful space and who, and who took the pieces of work that I have done and, and we put it up on the walls and they came along and they put all the posters up and everything on the tables so that you guys can, you find uh, women and men can walk around the room and see the real history of the Nelson Women's Center and the West Whitley Women's Association. Thanks a lot.